that's we've dealt with prohibited firearms. We've dealt with devices that are not firearms. We've dealt with firearms. We've dealt with ammunition. And we've dealt with everything that we may lawfully possess in terms of the act and may not lawfully possess in terms of the act. I think we can now start moving on to the actual licensing aspect. Yeah. Um, you've got your competency. And as we discussed in the competency sector, um, your competency un under Section 9 would say that you're competent to possess certain categories of firearms. Okay? There's handguns, there's manually operated rifles, there are shotguns, and there are self-loading rifles and carbines. Okay? Those are typically the four, the four categories of uh, firearms which can be licensed under the Act. Okay? Um, remember, prohibited firearms, um, also excluded fully auto firearms, etc. So once here's an important thing. Let's just quickly distinguish between ownership and possession of firearms. You may, without a competency, walk out today and go and buy all the firearms that your heart desires. You may not take lawful possession of those firearms until you hold a license permit or authorization in terms of the act for that firearm entitling such possession. Okay? So that's an important distinction. So a lot of guys wait for their competency to come through before they buy firearms. It's not necessary. You can start doing all the prep work and getting, you know, all of that footwork underway um, from the, you know, from any time preceding your competency training or your competency application or the receipt of your competency certificate. So it's just important to say that any person can buy a firearm. A person may only take possession of that firearm once it's licensed or authorized or permitted to be in his possession. So that was just a quick thing that I wanted to discuss. Um, I think the, the easiest way to go about this is let's deal with sections 13 to 20 and their headings and essentially the lawful purposes for which we may possess firearms in the Republic, or rather license firearms um, to possess them in, in the Republic of South Africa. First of all, we have section 13 of the Act, which is the self-defense section. Now, um, that's a firearm for the purposes of private defense or self-defense. Thereafter, um, so it's important to note that under that section, um, you may license a handgun, which is semi-automatic, or a shotgun, which is manually operated. So a pump action shotgun or a breakneck or hinge, hinge action shotgun or uh, anything except a semi-automatic shotgun. We then move on to section 14, which states that you may license a restricted firearm for self-defense under section 14 if you apply. Now a restricted firearm is a self-loading carbine or rifle or a self-loading shotgun in very particular circumstances. That would typically be uh, guys that live on farms with white rhino and um, they they face poachers on a daily basis and um, from a defensive perspective their engagement distances are going to be further than the typical um, suburban Fred. Uh, he might be shooting at poachers at 300 meters down the farm road. So their AR-15 or Kalim-4 or whatever it is a self-loading carbine might be the most sensible option um, and uh, you know that uh, again that can also be extended to the owners of uh, pretty high risk um, situations. So owners of potentially private diamond mines or, or mines or, um, you know, high value, uh, you know, high value items, couriers. Um, there, there are certain circumstances which justify uh, self-loading carbines and self-loading shotguns, their capacities and their force multiplication, which is obviously greater than a handguns. Um, in certain circumstances, when, when we start working with distance, potentially even start working with body armor threats. Um, that's that's where uh, Section 14 comes to light. I hope that's a crisp distinction. Yes, yes, uh, yes. Section 15 allows for the licensing of firearms for occasional hunting or occasional sport shooting. Now, very important. It uh, Let's just deal with Section 16 quickly, which follows Section 15. Uh, we have section 15, which is occasional hunting or sport shooting, and then section 16, which is dedicated hunting or sport shooting and sport shooting and or sport shooting. So dedicated uh, sport shooting uh, essentially requires a membership with an accredited sport shooting and or accredited hunting association. Um, and with that, um, section 16.2 typically prescribes that it must 
that membership certificate must comply with Section 16.2. So it must be an accredited association that offers accredited dedicated status, uh, which is typically also a, a, a practical and a theoretical test or exam that's passed. And then that status needs to be retained to remain a Section 16 license holder. Now, Section 15, the occasional hunter or sport shooter, doesn't prescribe any such membership, um, nor does it really prescribe any formal form of compliance except okay, the desire to occasionally hunt or sport shoot. The registrar tends to interpret Section 15.2, where it states that the, the registrar may issue a license in terms of Section 15, so for occasional hunting or sport shooting, to a person who is an occasional sport shooter or who is an occasional hunter. And that leaves a bit of interpretation room there. So we'll, we'll get, you know, we'll get to that if somebody wants to make contact with me or get into the, the thick of it. But typically, I always recommend that somebody um, at least just joins a local club to show that they, they have a legitimate and sincere interest in uh, participating in occasional sporting or target shooting activities, okay? That's that's my that's always my recommendation. Same with if they are for if it isn't an application for hunting, um, it's always good to attach some photographs of hunting participation historically. If you haven't been able to participate in hunting activities historically, deal with this expressly in the application. Say, it's my desire to participate. I've not had access. I need my own equipment. Blah blah blah. You know, um, to to lawfully uh, participate. But these are the crisp points. Very important while we're here to quickly distinguish the benefits of being a dedicated sports shooter. Sections 13 and 15, so self-defense and occasional hunting and sports shooting read together, limit you to a limit of four firearms, slot, four firearm slots, which can be composed of only two handguns. So only one under section 13 and only one under section 15. Um, so you, you may only possess a maximum of two handguns and only uh, one under section 13, one under section 15. You can't have two under section 15 or two under section 30. Um, you're, you're limited to that, that amount of handguns without dedicated sport shooting status. Um, if you don't want handguns, you can have four rifles or four shotguns. Um, that's And a very important distinction is section 15 limits you to manually operated shotguns and manually operated rifles for occasional hunting or occasional sport shooting. Um, you may possess semi-automatic handguns under Section 15 for occasional hunting or sport shooting. However, Section 16 allows the licensing of all four categories, um, where Section 15 only allows the first three categories. So Section 16 allows self-loading carbines and self-loading shotguns. Um, that's that's an important distinction. Further, if you are not if you do not hold dedicated sport shooting status you're limited to a maximum of 200 cartridges per license. Um, so that's essentially per firearm. Um, so if you have a nine millimeter pistol under section 15, you're limited to 200 cartridges, which we all know is not even a, you know, a full practice session, um, typically you know, in the practical shooting sphere. Um, it's, it's one of those, so section 16, also allows you to possess an unlimited number of firearms uh, for dedicated sport shooting and and or dedicated hunting purposes. Um, this is where it you know those are the important distinctions between the two sections. Um, so if I could wrap that up into a more concise uh, model for easy digestion, section sixteen allows more than four firearms. Section sixteen allows you an unlimited number of handguns. Um, whereas section 13 and 15 only allows you a maximum of two handguns. It allows you uh, more than 200 cartridges per license um, and um, what else? Oh, and it allows you to license uh, self-loading carbines and self-loading shotguns. So semi-automatic rifles or carbines and semi-automatic shotguns. What's very interesting is you have a specific competency for a self-loading rifle and carbine, but in order to get a self-loading shotgun, you simply need a shotgun competency and you simply need dedicated status, either hunting or sport shooting status. So mm -hmm. there is no competency for a self-loading shotgun. Um, there's a competency for shotgun paired with dedicated status. You can apply for a self-loading shotgun under section 16. So those 
That's section 15 and 16 in a nutshell. Um, another important thing under section 16, once you've acquired a license in, under section 16, it's valid for 10 years. Um, for that 10 year period, you need to maintain your dedicated status. And upon renewal for a further 10 years, you need to maintain that dedicated status. So each accredited association has its own criteria for maintenance of that status. Um, typically, it would be two hunting activities for dedicated hunting status per annum or two uh, uh, sport shooting activities per annum for the retention of your dedicated sport shooting status. Um, again, contact your accredited association or an accredited association of your interest um, to find out what the criteria are of acquiring that status and maintaining that status. Always know what you're in for. Um, two hunts a year can be quite expensive, uh, but it, it's nice that they do recognize smaller activities as well, um, yeah. you know, hunting related activities. Yeah. So that's section 15 and 16 in a nutshell. Um, perfect. And then section 17, um, this is typically relates to uh, licenses for private collections. So firearm license for a private collector, um, that would be members of uh, accredited collectors associations such as, I think it's SACA, uh, which is the South African Accredited Collectors Association, I believe. And um, uh, they essentially, you would motivate to SACA that this is why you require the firearm. And SACA will then uh, give you uh, essentially a certificate of collectability. Um, if they're satisfied with that, and then the registrar will accept that application as, and he will issue a Section 17 license for that collector item. But it's very well regulated, and it's a, there are different categories of collection as well. And that's one of the caveats where they set a prohibited firearm, a fully automatic firearm, uh, under certain collector categories for, for the preservation of those, those collector values, um, some fully automatic firearms are allowed uh, to be uh, possessed, lawfully possessed by collectors. But it's it's very strict control measures, et cetera, in place. So to find out more, maybe reach out to SACA uh, or even classic arms who have a very big role in the preservation of historic historically valuable firearms in South Africa. Um, they do great work in as far as that's concerned because so many of our, our historical guns have been butchered over the years. Um, yeah. you know, so... Then moving on to 18 is a permit for the possession of private uh, a private ammunition collection. Um, that's if somebody wishes to collect cartridges or uh, historically valuable cartridges or, or um, rather a series of uh, potentially collectible value cartridges. Uh, so that that's the beauty is in the eye of the beholder. You know, they might find Aki cartridges interesting and that's what they want to collect or the different Aki renditions. Yeah. So, that's, that's also a very specific type of permit. Then um, Section 19 deals with uh, public collections, so uh, uh, firearm licenses for public collections. And then lastly, Section 20 deals with um, firearm licenses for business purposes. Now, there are different business purposes prescribed in the Act, um, which are, are recognized as categories on their own. And then it, it is broadened or extended by the registrar. But typically, the second that a firearm is being used uh, to ge generate an income or, or to, to generate revenue um, or to render a service therewith, um, it falls under Section 20. So that's another thing um, a lot of people must consider. Uh, if, if they're using personal firearms for uh, you know, certain uh, business applications, potentially consider the wording of Section 20 and get some advice around business purposes. But typically, uh, Section 20 identifies uh, the, the licensing of uh, firearms for business purposes for security. So that's CIRA accredited um, uh, companies or security companies. And then uh, secondly, for theater, film and uh, television, uh, game ranching, hunting, and then other business purposes. So game ranching, funny enough, is also uh, defined in the regulations or in the act as, um, well, sorry, rather in the regulations as uh, running a game farm for the purposes of hunting. It's not for ecotourism. So I've recently done a game reserve, a private game reserves uh, business purposes, which was under other business purposes because it was for 458 lots, um, you know, for guided walks 
where there are dangerous thick skinned game animals or essentially goed is wat jou by krap trap you know like that uh, the their proximity or their presence on that land necessitated the need for large boar stopping rifles uh, for the guides who are well, for gas accredited etc but that doesn't fall under game ranching because game ranching is game ranching particularly for the purpose of hunting so that game ranch would have its own uh, firearms or for the breeding of game you know um, and for the management of game and then hunting uh, interestingly enough will also be for um you know say for instance a, a, a professional hunting operation um, or outfitters who require those those uh, firearms to rent out to clients and potentially to issue to their you know to their uh, hunters in the field um or to the yep. you know their professional hunters it's difficult sometimes that does clash a little bit with section 16 a um, mm -hmm. of the act which sorry i did so section 16 capital a um, I skipped that, which is license for professional hunting. And that would typically be issued to a person with uh, a, affiliation with an accredited dedic uh, professional hunting association, such as FASA or the, the con uh, I think it's the uh, uh, FASA and the, not confederation, but the custodians of professional hunting of South Africa. Sorry, those are the two quite large professional hunting bodies in South Africa. So that that typically wraps up the licensing sections um, from, you know, section 13 through to section 20. Now, just a brief one, section 21 of the Act deals with uh, temporary authorizations or permits to possess firearms. Now, a lot of, so this is typically used by people that urgently need a firearm for a sporting, you know, sporting or a hunting event. Um, it's, it's very rarely um, approved by our registrar and it's typically for non-citizens it's the the most common mechanism here in South Africa has been non-citizens applying for temporary uh, authorization to possess firearms in the country for sporting events or for hunting you know for hunting uh, trips but it's it's become a very technical sphere fraught with sort of pitfalls and uh, internal internal measures or policies at at uh, the registry which are quite opposed or uh, difficult to you know to secure these types of temporary authorization permits again this is now the ambit of experts um, martin hood for instance has got a couple of these section 21 permits done mm -hmm. um, that's with nj hood and associates um, i think they're the specialists at this stage in the country with these types of you know, uh, permits, the Section 21 permits uh, especially, and um, I'd, I'd recommend them getting in touch with uh, MJ Hood and Associates on the Section 21 side of things. Um, but yeah, that 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 concludes the different lawful purposes, if I could put it that way, for, for licensing of firearms in South Africa and which categories of firearms we're allowed to license for which purposes, yeah. I think you've covered, so I think um, for, the, for the average citizen, Am I am I correct if I say that we are looking at section 13, 15, and 16 as a sort of a generalization to say, me as Joe Soap on the street, I can license a firearm under one of these three. Obviously, if I want to be a collector or whatever, there's there's different ones. But I think for the main for the main purpose, we're looking at these three sections. You've you've sort of touched on what firearms can be licensed under sections. So maybe if you can just but I'll stop quickly on that for us again to, to just ensure that I know what what then constitutes a self-defense firearm, if I can call it that. Absolutely. So so under Section 13, it would be a handgun, so a semi-automatic handgun. Now, there's this a semi-automatic handgun is essentially, again, I pull the trigger, and every time I pull the trigger, there's a single shot until I reset that trigger, and I fire a subsequent shot by depressing the trigger again. So semi-automatic handguns, so that includes both semi-automatic slide-operated handguns or revolvers um, for, for that consideration, for that matter. Um, then manually operated shotguns. So under Section 13, you may license a pump-action shotgun or a, a, a hinge breakneck shotgun or a um, lever-action shotgun or something of that nature. Um, those are the limitations in terms of self-defense under Section 13. Um, 
under section 14 again that's that's for uh, restricted firearms self-loading shotguns and self-loading carbines we've given some insight into which circumstances those may be licensed for uh, typically uh, farmers with uh, heavy poaching operations on their farms or people with high value assets or businesses which need uh, that that degree of force multiplication um, it could probably start being argued that section 14 should be uh, allowed for the typical Joe Soap as well in defending his home because now they're hitting our homes in gangs of five or six oaks with AKs or with, you know, uh, police stolen R5s. That's you know, true. probably security industry trained individuals as well. You know, where do we draw the line with, uh, you know, if he has one, I should have one too. Yep. Uh, but let's not get into the, you know, the libertarian side of things. I think that's a, that's a sensitive topic and I suppose that some things need to be policed and we need to submit ourselves to the state to the to the greatest degree, especially now with the fully auto stuff, because, you know, we already have stigmas that we fight with the semi-auto guns or black guns and ghost guns and, yes. you know, high, capacity and high power and, you know, all the Assault stuff. rifles. Assault rifles, yeah. So um, section 15, we can license semi-automatic handguns again, uh, semi-automatic slide operated handguns or revolvers uh, for sporting or hunting. Um, this is now where one needs to be cautious because you, uh, most provincial hunting ordinances, you'd require a permit for the use of a semi-auto slide operated handgun um, if you want to hunt with it. Uh, and it would also typically have a, a minimum caliber, like uh, I think 454 Casul or 10 yep. ball, or, you know, a 44 Magnum calibers of that nature. Um, then, so yeah, uh, handguns, uh, shotguns under section 15 may only be manually operated. So pump action or hinge breakneck. So typically that's for occasional sport shooting or occasional hunting. Um, then manually operated rifles under section 15, bolt action rifles, lever action rifles, pump action rifles, uh, hinge breakneck action rifles, um, all the different action rifles, except firearms which are self-loading in nature. Um, so again, section 16, so, so under section 15, handguns, rifles which are manually operated, and shotguns which are manually operated. Under section 16, handguns, manually operated rifles, self-loading rifles, manually operated shotguns, self-loading shotguns, those five categories. Um, we've now covered in episode one the ins and outs around the competencies, and now we've discussed what a firearm is, what ammunition is, and under which sections I can actually obviously then license which firearms. Now we've we've come up to this point, okay, now I've got my competency, I know which you know, a section I want to license my firearm on there. I've got an idea what I want to license. So what then is the licensing process? How does that work? If you can explain that. Excellent. Thanks, John. So so I'm going to try and keep this as brief as possible. I know that Max, Rusty, and Brief are pretty distant terms, but I'll give it a it's back. It's just your surname that's short. That's about it. <laughs> and, and me physically. So I think uh, where we get to now is you've, you've got your competency. You've purchased your firearm from a dealer. When you purchase a firearm from a dealer, the, the confirmatory document that you'd receive is a SAPS 271 form. And that SAPS 271 form is titled Application for a License to Possess a Firearm. It's a wonderful form that they fill in partially for you. And it's got the gun's details and it's got the dealer's details and the seller's details. So again, firearms don't only have to be purchased from a dealership. Uh, let's, let's just take this thing. It can be purchased from a private seller, so a per person with a valid license, from a dealer, from an estate, um, and even from a trust. So that's always a very important um, distinction as well as that, you know, you don't only have to apply from a dealership. SAPS 271 form is always the form that will be used, and it will embody both the seller's details as well as the license applicant's details, the purchaser's details. So we move on then, so we've purchased the gun from the dealer. I'm going to work, most most purchases in the beginning are either from a dealer or a private person. And um, 
we're going to work on that basis for now. So we purchase the firearm and we get our SAPS 271 form that has the seller's details on it. So either the dealer or the private person's details on it. And um, that with that form, if it's a dealer, you'll get a SAPS 350 form attached to the SAPS 271. The SAPS 350 form just shows that that firearm is on dealer stock. Um, that on that particular dealer's dealer stock. So the EFRS system will pick up, or sorry, just the SAPS data system will pick up that this gun is licensed or, or not licensed, but is on the dealer stock of this dealer. And you may lawfully apply for it through this dealership. So they'll, they'll have a background, right? The dealer is who the dealer purports to be. This gun is with that dealer. Good. Apply for the license through that, that channel. If it's a private seller, the private seller will give you a SAPS 271, a copy of his ID document and a copy of his license card, um, front and back of his license card, valid license card, be that as it may. Um, now, on that on that note, you've now got a SAPS 271 with the, the seller's documents. What do we need to do now? So we fill in our SAPS 271 form and there are certain supporting documents which need to be submitted uh, depending on the type of license we're applying for. Um, so typically under a section 13 applicant, so that in all license applications, you're going to submit two color ID photographs, uh, two copies of your identity document, not proof of residence. Um, so two color ID photos, two uh, ID copies, a copy of your competency certificate to possess that particular category of firearm. Um, then any other firearm licenses that you may have attached there too. And then supporting documents for section 13 so proving that you need the firearm for self-defense crime statistics articles blah 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 section 15 um, for occasional hunting as i said or occasional sport shooting um, you're going to submit photographs of hunting participation and or membership of a gun club or even accredited association membership whatever it may be to to support that occasional usage. Uh, it's it's a step before dedicated status. Then under section 16, you're going to submit a membership certificate to an accredited association, which is actually under section 16 too, the only requirement. And this is where it gets frustrating because internal policy now prescribes also the attachment of a dedicated hunting status certificate, which I suppose if you read section 16, goes hand in hand with that dedicated status. So you must be a member of an accredited association and that accredited association must confer upon you a certificate to show that you are a dedicated hunter or sports sport person. And then one of the made up ones is an endorsement, uh, which they'll refuse an application on if it's not provided from the accredited association under section 16. And that endorsement is to show that the firearm is fit for that purpose. So the, that association deems or endorses the firearm as fit for purpose. I've turned this over on appeal a couple of times where it was refused because no endorsement attached. It's not a, a legislative requirement. And uh, it also it's sort of fallen into that very dangerous sphere of um, if you keep giving them stuff that's not supposed to be in there, it's going to become internal, you know, internal uh, protocol or internal, you know, policy. And uh, we should try and avoid um, over... What's the what's the right word? Uh, over in, uh, appeasing SAPs on that basis, you know, not giving them funny documents which aren't legislatively prescribed or don't really tie in with the regis, you know, legislative prescripts. Um, and then also typically on the bundle of what would be submitted with an application is always photographs of the safe, even though it's not prescribed in the act, um, it's become internal policy. Um, throughout the years that that is what is submitted with that bundle then at the moment uh, an application for a license is 175 rand take that exact amount with you when you're applying um, often the treasurer at that certain police station won't have the the required um, you know change or you know the system will be down or whatever don't don't take a card with don't take a 200 rand note with take 175 rand with that tariff goes up every year. Um, another thing um, that we just need to note is the validity periods between the different sections. So that is how we apply for license. So let's finish the process. We've now compiled our bundle. We go to our designated firearms officer, who is the, the DFO 
where our safe is located. The closest police station to your safe, that's your DFO. Don't complicate it with where I work and where I do you know, CrossFit and where I shoot my 6.5 vegan. Your safe will dictate the DFO, the closest proximity. Um, then uh, you go to your DFO with your bundle, your 175 Rand exactly cash, and uh, all of those supporting documents, and you say, right, I want to apply. First thing they'll do is check if it's on the system, uh, if it's assigned to that seller, and they'll confirm, right, this is the right guy. He's the owner of firearm. That's, you know, the seller is, is legit. Um, we're going to allow the application. While we start processing this application, go and pay for it. You'll run upstairs to Treasury or to the, the Treasurer's office. You'll pay your 175 Rand exactly cash, and you will get a confirmation of payment. This is gold. This is one of the most important documents you're issued with. Okay, you keep that receipt for payment. Um, you go downstairs or, or go back to uh, the DFO, who's now halfway processing your application, making sure everything's there. And they will then make you do fingerprints and sign the application in front of them. And uh, it's a pretty, pay it should be a pretty painless one hour process, at, you know, maximum. But some DFOs, you know, I'm not going to get into a socio-political debate, but, you know, some DFOs just, um, they've, they've, as a law unto themselves, uh, created this uh, appointment system where you must make an appointment, you know, two months down the line to apply for the license. And whether you're in Hong Kong or, you know, Sydney at that time, not their problem. You get an appointment. And uh, apparently, you know, some oaks are happy with that and you know you know it works better for me uh but you know for for me i just i can't imagine being told when i'm allowed to go to the fire station or call call you know call saps listen there's a robbery outside my house you don't make appointments for these types of services be that as it may i said i won't get into it um so typically the process should be quick and it, it should be a walk in the service and uh, you should pay and you should get your confirmation and um, there will be a book that you sign in to say, or, or typically where they'll fill your details in for the application and that date. And they should process that application within the next couple of days, okay? Some DFOs, month, two months, they're not in a rush. And uh, what they'll do then is you'll get this wonderful SMS that says your firearm license, your uh, with serial number and caliber receives attention at the DFO and that commences the electronic process. The second you get that, you'll get a reference number and you download an app like Where's My App or the Safari Outdoor app and you go and you put in your, your reference number, your ID and your serial number for that firearm and you can track the process from its initiation to its finalization. Um, it gives you a pretty good indicator as well on average days and when they anticipate it should be finalized, etc. It's never the case. Um, but, you know, it, it gives you some guideline as to, to what the, the, the typical license process period is. It used to be anything from a year to two years in, in the early 2000s, just after the act was, come, you know, incepted. Uh, then it, it started to uh, become a bit more efficient to about a year and then it came down to about six months or 90 business days or um, which is the typical sort of golden standard of how long a firearm license should take to um, you know process it it got really exciting at the beginning of this year with licenses being processed in under three months you know two months or a couple of weeks you know and it was as if fireworks were going off and then bang it just went dead again you know it just crawled again from from a certain point, I can't remember which auspicious day marked the meltdown, but it just returned to its previous, you know, sort of sluggish pace. And, um, you know, now we're back to about a six, four to six month turnaround time on license applications. Uh, the process that you'll follow will typically be um, payment received, uh, sent to provincial DFO as step two, which is your, provin your province's DFO. And from there, it's, it's moved to the CFR, which is Pretoria-based, uh, the Central Firearms Registry. And um, there, that is where the app then is considered after several months um, by the registrar. And the registrar will then say, wow, okay, cool. This application looks good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to issue this license. And on that day, you, or, or typically a couple of days after, you'll receive an SMS from SAP saying your license has been approved. 
and uh, tears will fill your eyes and you'll take off work early and you'll get in your car and uh, you'll say you've got a family emergency and you'll shoot through to your DFO and they'll print out this A4 sheet uh, pending the issue of your license card, which allows you to take possession of your firearm. And um, it's probably one of the best things after the birth of your child and your marriage or your wedding day uh, is, you know, your approval SMS. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's always a very special day. And uh, I, I hope for many more for all of you. And um, that, that printout now, uh, also it's golden. Uh, keep very, very uh, a special protection of it. It's tantamount to a license. If you don't have one of those, you've got a problem. You sign it out as well uh, when the DFO prints it out. Uh, so the date that your SMS comes in that it's been approved, I'd say give it 24 hours for the system to update before you go. And the next day, be there at 7.30, ready for the DFO to walk into his office and print out your magical A4 that you can take possession of your firearm. And uh, race off to the gun shop or your children's house that sold you the gun. Take possession of it. And uh, always be cognizant of the prescripts of law as to how to lawfully carry that firearm. Don't open carry your 375 H&H in public. Um, and, you know, uh, don't carry your AR-15 over its sling in public. Uh, there are protocols for this. Um, we can we can deal with that as well on, on the carriage, the lawful car carriage of firearms. But essentially, comply with the carriage. Take your rifle bag with to the dealer. Put your rifle in its rifle bag. Carry it to the car. Cradle it softly. And, uh, you know, go and enjoy it on the range and in the hunting field. And same applies to your AR-15 or your, your handgun. Go and enjoy the sports. Go and, you know, get proficient with the guns. Um, it's such a pleasure to be part of the lawful firearm owning community. And, yeah, we, we're passionate about it, all of us. Yeah, Definitely, definitely. Max, I think that's it. Thank you for your time once again and your insights and your sharing your experience and your knowledge in this field. I think it's very valuable. Um, I think next time we can start delving into the lawful use of potentially lethal force um, and and all those ugly questions that people ask, you know. But can yeah, I shoot? Yeah, I'm, very, yeah. I'm, I'm very excited, actually. You know, um, if, I, if I can let the cat out of the bag, we're going to have... Uh, uh, a criminal law expert with us, uh, uh, Mr. Francois de Kock, or Francois de Kock attorneys. Uh, we co-authored an article which we'll reference in the next video uh, called, you know, Lawful Considerations in Self-Defense. And it, it's kind of like a crash course in, you know, the, the defensive question. And uh, Francois has a very keen um, criminal aptitude, uh, criminal law aptitude, not a criminal aptitude. And... Um, He's, a, he's an exceptional practitioner. Um, I, I enjoy working with him. We studied together at the University of Pretoria and um, probably one of the most capable firearms attorneys out there as well. So from a firearm offense perspective, uh, Francois is your man. So if I ever have trouble, I phone Francois. And, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's where the, there's, and uh, we'll discuss the ins and outs of, you know, as you said, the lawful use of force in South Africa. And uh, what if, uh, he throws a bottle at me and, you know, all the hypotheticals. So we're all ready right. for those. Interviews and, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Dion, for your time. Max, thank you so much. And, um, yeah, looking forward to the next session. Awesome. Stay safe. Dion, you too. Cheers.